Welcome, everyone, and I want to give a particularly warm welcome to Congressman Rob Whitman uh, from my home state of Virginia. Uh, Congressman Whitman serves on the House Armed Services Committee and the House Natural Resources Committee. Um, and importantly for this discussion, uh, he also serves on the House Select Committee on Strategic Competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party. Um, he's got a varied background, including holding a PhD in public policy and administration from Virginia Commonwealth University, a Master of Public Health in Health Policy and Administration from the University of North Carolina, mm -hmm. and then a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology from Virginia Tech. So yes. congratulations. That is an extraordinary list, and Thank welcome you. to CSIS. Well, Dr. Jones, great to be here with you. Let me first start off with um, uh, a question, because I know you're just back recently from yes. uh, the region. Uh, you, you visited Japan, the Philippines, and then Taiwan, yes. which I think as I speak to you here, uh, among other things, you are uh, wearing a tie yes. uh, from the president yes. uh, of Taiwan. Uh, and I'm wondering what your major, in addition to the tie, what, mm -hmm. what are the major takeaways from the trip on uh, the Chinese and the importance of U.S. Sure. alliances in the region? Well, as I've had the opportunity to travel to the Indo-Pacific over the years, what really impressed me about this trip was the sense of urgency now with the countries that we visited. The governments there, such as the government of Japan, is ramping up their efforts. They're doubling their defense budget, which is very unusual for Japan, on a very steep ramp to be able to build a military that will now be the third largest military in the world. They understand the enterprise that needs to happen. Places like the Philippines, where before under President Duterte, there was somewhat of an ambivalence towards the United States, much more of a populist viewpoint with the new president there, President Ferdinand Marcos. They are all in about how they're working with the United States to prepare uh, against a potential Chinese incursion into Taiwan. Also, the activities that are happening there uh, in, in the Spratleys. We, we, we were able to observe that directly. It's incredible the aggressive behavior that's going on there, and, and the Philippines uh, understands that and is doing everything they can to push back against that. Had a great meeting there with President Tsai, Foreign Minister Wu. Uh, they are also uh, solely focused on making sure they deter the Chinese threat. They understand what needs to happen there. Their military service requirement now has gone from four months to 12 months. So they're making all the necessary efforts in country. The big thing that was part of that discussion was the delay in foreign military sales from the United States, especially in areas that are important to them, that is the backlog of F-16 F sales and spare parts for their F-16. So we had great conversations about that. Also foreign military sales for littoral combat ships to, uh, to Taiwan, which is an effort that I uh, started at the very beginning of this year to make sure that we are doing things to provide them direct assistance in a timely way. So we had great conversations there. Also earlier had the American-Australia legislative dialogue, had great conversations with Prime Minister Albanese as well as members of the parliament there in Australia. They are all on board too with the AUKUS agreement and the things that we are going to do as three nations in that area, Australia, UK, and the United States. The most important part of that that doesn't make the headlines is pillar two. What are we going to do in the areas of technology, artificial intelligence, quantum computing? That to me holds the greatest promise for what we can do to counter the Chinese in the area. So, so the whole mindset of people in that region I have seen just in the past five years has changed almost 180 degrees. So two questions that come from yes. that. The first one um, is uh, to pick up on your point on foreign military sales yes. and technology transfers. Um, the, you know, there are many people who, uh, who now note that the, our foreign military sales, pro our entire process, which includes yes. elements of the Department of Defense, state, and obviously the uh, Congress has an important role in that, mm -hmm. as well as technology transfers, are designed for a period where you know, we weren't involved in competition with the Chinese. We were right. conducting counterterrorism operations. Uh, what, what is your sense about how we start to fix these, some of the uh, foreign military sales in particular, yes. especially getting some of the aid that, con that, um, uh, that Taiwan, for example, yes. or, other, or a range of other countries need and need 
quickly. Yes. When, when things start getting delayed and the timelines for mm -hmm. conflict in Taiwan start to shrink, yes. then time is of the essence. It is. We had a hearing the other day where we had folks from the Department of Defense and State Department talk specifically about foreign military sales, why we see these delays, especially when timeliness is of essence with addressing the threat from China against Taiwan. Uh, the processes are, are too administratively burdened. We have to make sure we streamline them. Another element that is equally as important as mil foreign military sales are the ITAR provisions, the transfer of technology. Here's the ironic part of it. We have this AUKUS agreement, which essentially has the deepest uh, agreement with any countries around the world in what we're going to do to share technology, nuclear technology for submarines, artificial intelligence. Yet, under ITAR provisions, we actually treat Canada better than we do Australia. So that, that dichotomy is unacceptable. And I've been working with uh, now the new ambassador of the United States, Kevin Rudd, former prime minister there, about how do we, how do we fix ITAR? How do we make sure that it truly is uh, adaptive, that it responds to changing threats around the world, and make sure, too, that we operate with our closest friends and allies from a higher level of trust? You know, we go into this sometimes with, a, with, a, with an arrogance to say nobody can protect information like we can, and we look, you know, sort of speciously at, at our friends, which we shouldn't do. And let me tell you, we, with what we've gone through here recently with security breaches, uh, we should be the last ones to be lecturing somebody else about what they need to do. We need to make sure we demonstrate that trust. Timeliness is, is of essence. ITAR needs to change. Same with foreign military sales. It needs to reflect timeliness and needs ref to reflect the need for us to operate at much higher levels of trust with our friends and allies. I know there have been some discussions as part of the National Defense Authorization Act discussions yes. about um, uh, potentially giving waivers to Australia and the United Kingdom. They are both Five Eyes countries, yes. as is Canada. We share our most exquisite intelligence with those mm -hmm. countries. It, would that be a, a, a step to, uh, worth, worth considering? Absolutely, and we've had conversations about that. I do think you'll see some of that reflected in this year's NDAA to make sure the Five Eyes countries are all treated the same and to make sure that we have that flow of technology and information and intelligence as, we ha as we've demonstrated in the past. The problem is, is there, there have been disparities there. We have to fix that. If we are going to be able to leverage the capacity and capability that we need to deter the Chinese, it has to be uh, a, a world-based enterprise with all of our friends and allies. We cannot do this by ourselves. We don't have unlimited resources uh, here in this nation. We don't also have uh, the, the capabilities in a number of areas that other countries have. If we can bring those things together, we truly have the ability to deter the Chinese. If we think we can do this by ourselves, we will lack the resources and will lack the timeliness to really have an effect on where China's going today. I wonder if we can just pull up the screen for a second, because um, you did talk about um, uh, some of the things that you saw while you were on your most recent trip. And so here we have uh, some of the disputed territorial claims in the South and East China Seas. If we look uh, at the Spratlys, which is what you mentioned here, yes. uh, so I've circled that for everyone here to see. These are contested, yes. what used to be um, atolls. Mm -hmm. uh, now they are islands, they're military bases uh, that the Chinese has uh, established. In fact, if we look here at one of them, this is Mischief Reef. This is our satellite yes. imagery of yes. Mischief Reef. We've got um, missile shelters. Mm -hmm. We've got point defenses. We've got radar installations. We've got runways that um, are used and can be used for uh, military aircraft, yes. combat aircraft, hangars. These are, ba these are military bases in disputed areas. Yes. How big of a concern, even based on inter is is this kind of activity the Chinese are doing? Oh, it's incredibly concerning. Their effort within uh, the first island chain there, in the Spratly Island chain, is all about uh, a military dominance. Uh, we actually were able to get a very, very specific brief when we were there in the Philippines about the aggressive behavior against Philippine vessels that were trying to support uh, a vessel that's there on Second Thomas Shoal. The Sierra Madre is essentially the, the Philippines' base of operations out of there. They were trying to go there to actually keep that in a good state of repair. 
Chinese Coast Guard vessels were using water cannons to blast these vessels that were trying to go there and maintain the Sierra Madre. We got to see two fiery cross reef uh, and all the militarization that goes on there. These are airstrips, they are radars, they're surface to air missiles. There's only one intention for that and that is to, to push others out of that region, to create a threat for others in the air defense identification zone to push others out. And, and we got some, some very uh, incredible briefings about the activities of the Chinese in that area. They are, in, they are almost over the top in their aggressiveness. Here's what Taiwan's having to deal with. The Chinese fly almost on a daily basis into the air defense identification zone. When they do that, the Taiwan Air Force scrambles their jets to go intercept them because they want to make sure that they are creating at least that, that deterrent effect. They're understanding where the Chinese are going and one day they may obviously make an effort to, 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 to take the island. What happens though with that is that those F-16s, because of that, that continual f flight hours that they accumulate, become worn. Mm -hmm. And that is where we are right now in trying to supply the spare parts and the maintenance and the upgrades for those aircraft in order to make sure that the Taiwan Air Force have what they need, uh, that backlog of military sales has a big, big impact. So we see this incredibly aggressive efforts in, that, in those areas, uh, and we know what the Chinese are trying to do. They're trying to push others out. We know our freedom of navigation operations there are always met with very aggressive actions by the Chinese, and they even engage other fishing vessels. I mean, when our, when our vessels go into those areas, it's not just another Chinese military vessels. It's scores of other vessels that surround our vessels to try to impede their navigation through the area. So China's incredibly aggressive about what they're doing. A lot of times it doesn't make the headlines. This last one with the water cannons on the, on the support vessels there was really where, uh, where people saw the true intent of the Chinese. If we could just pull up the map one more time. Yeah, I, uh, I wanna just um, hone in a little bit on Taiwan because we're talking about it right now. I think one, one of the things that is interesting is you watch Chinese activity in this area, PLA activity in this area. Yes. We see them, as you've noted, push up to that 24 nautical mile area around yes. Taiwan. We've also seen them fly drones right. uh, over some of Taiwan's islands, Kinmen, Matsu, and you know, part of the broader question here is, are we doing enough to help Taiwan here? I think when we certainly saw the Russians invade Ukraine, uh, the U.S. had provided some assistance yes. to the Ukrainians so that they could defend themselves. Are we doing enough to help Taiwan defend itself in case of uh, a, a additional aggression in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first thing we have to do is to make sure we fill this backlog of foreign military sales. The whole idea about, well, you know, Taiwan is in line and we'll get to you when you're in line, it just doesn't make sense. There needs to be a priority. We need to fulfill these foreign military sales. The other things that we need to do are additional efforts to help train the Taiwanese military. We have Taiwan soldiers that come here, and, and as we talk to officials in Taiwan, their young folks that are coming in for required military service want a more professionalized training, and they're getting that. That's a good thing. The additional efforts that we're doing in providing a military uh, advice to, to, the, to the Taiwanese forces there is incredibly important. Making sure, too, that we have, as we did somewhat in, in Ukraine, but have to do more so in Taiwan, is we have to make sure we bring in as much as we can and supplies and support to Taiwan now. Because if China tries to take the island, you are not gonna be able to bring in anything then. It's gonna be a highly contested environment. Everything will be at risk. So we're working to get as much into the islands as we can to complete these foreign military sales to make sure we have supplies, munitions. And this is a logistical fight too. Remember, it's not just about munitions, but it's also Taiwan's an island, very different than Ukraine. So it's about fuel supplies, it's about food, all the things that China will try to do to cut them off if they try to take the island. Yeah, it is interesting um, that uh, when one looks at the differences uh, between the Taiwan case and the Ukraine one on aid, mm -hmm. uh, the Russians never provided enough forces into Ukraine 
to block the border. So there was an open border right. once that invasion happened where the U.S., other uh, European countries could provide yes. all types of assistance mm -hmm. to Ukraine through countries like Poland. It was an, it's right. an open border. It still is an open border. Sure. Taiwan is an island. Yes. And so once that, uh, if there is a war, once that war starts, uh, we've already seen in, in reaction um, uh, to some U.S. activity mm -hmm. that the uh, PLA will likely blockade the yes. island, yes. which will make it very difficult to fly anything in mm -hmm. or bring anything in on surface vessels. Yes. Meaning that, you know, that really does highlight your point that um, if we're going to get anything in uh, before anything starts, it has to come in now. Yes. Uh, there is a broader question here, which is, um, you know, as you talk to your constituents, um, what a what do you take to be China's main um, uh, goals mm -hmm. as it looks at the United States and expands its power? Uh, yeah, I don't think you use the word competition, so it would be helpful right. to hear what 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 do you call it? What the Chinese are doing, and then sort of second, why should Americans, whether they're Virginians or others? care about this area, care about Taiwan? Sure. Uh, listen, I think this is much more than a competition. I think it's, it's incorrect to call it a competition. A competition is where you level the playing field and said, let, let, let's compete with the same set of rules. China has no interest in that. China wants to dominate. So China will use every means, uh, uh, nefarious or otherwise, uh, uh, ethical or otherwise, to win this competition, to dominate the United States, to dominate the world economy, to have a clear advantage over the United States, to displace the United States in markets, to deter the United States in certain activities that it does. So China's all in on this. I think what the American people are beginning to realize is that China, China's intent is, is not to say, well, let's, let's see where things play out in a, in a fair competition. China's intent is to indeed weaken the United States, weaken it strategically, weaken it economically, to push it out of where it is today in, the, in, its, in its predominance e economically, not only in the United States, but around the world. I think, I think more people are understanding that. I think this, though, I think we, as, as folks in elected positions across the United States, executive branch and legislative branch, need to call this out for what it is. This is the threat of our lifetime. This is on the magnitude of what the world faced in 1938. It's different in its, in, its, in its outward appearance. The Chinese are much more nefarious in certain ways. But if you look at the overall effort, it is the same. If we are going to be successful in deterring the Chinese and making sure that they do not dominate us, that we still hold our place to have the strongest economy in the world, to make sure that we stop their aggressive behavior around the world, which is exploitive and transactive, uh, I want to make sure that we call this for what it is. And that is, this has to be an all of nation effort. Everybody across the nation has to understand what it will take to win in this effort against the Chinese on world domination on their part. Uh, and it will take some sacrifice. This isn't going to be something where you just keep doing what you're doing and everything is going to, going to turn out okay. And I think that's incumbent upon all of us to call out the magnitude of this threat and to call out the Chinese for what they are doing. And, and that will mean sometimes reflecting on China in, in very negative ways. The, the element of, of this, though, that is, is, I think, very impactful on China is that they do not like being called out. They do not like being looked at uh, negatively by the world. They, they have this, this mindset that somehow what they're doing is, is, is going to be portrayed in a good way around the world. It's not. So we have to call it out for what it is, and we have to make sure, too, that we strengthen our relationships with our friends and allies. That's the way we can most successfully deter and keep China from dominating the world. So part of what we've talked about so far uh, one might call it sort of at the conventional level. We've talked yeah. about um, potential Chinese conventional action in and around Taiwan. Uh, we've looked at their military bases, some of their conventional activity in and around the South China Sea. The Chinese are also heavily engaged in a lot of activity below that threshold yes. of conventional war. We've done a lot of work here, for example, on Chinese gray zone, uh, irregular political warfare, yes. to use the term that um, former Cold War U.S. diplomat George Kennan used. Mm -hmm. What What is your sense about um, 
what are the primary activities the Chinese are doing below the threshold of conventional war? They're certainly engaged in espionage, yes. cyber operations, information and disinformation yes. operations, mm -hmm. some of the United Front work that includes um, activity in and around our universities yes. and our um, colleges, uh, cyber, economic coercion. So there's a, there's a list of, of items that uh, people have have pulled together and looked at what what are the issues that concern you most uh, along those lines well I don't think there's one that predominates there I think all of them should concern us because you have to look at these activities in total and they're additive so one complements the other and creates a greater level of risk and and the Chinese are looking at any way possible for their efforts to negatively impact the United States and this is sort of the death by a thousand cuts uh, analogy that I use in looking at this. So what we have to do to counter that is to look at all of these activities, whether it's a Confucius Institute at a university, whether it's cyber espionage to go in and try to steal intellectual property or trade secrets from, from companies. Uh, we have to make sure that we, we up our game and look at every aspect where we can either identify these nefarious activities by China that we can push those activities out, that we can call the Chinese out, that we hold the Chinese accountable for these activities, many of them right on the very edge of whether they're legal or not, and, and where we have weakness in what we can do statutorily against the Chinese, I think we need to strengthen our statutes to make sure we counter these, these activities. And I think we've looked at it somewhat innocently through the years and thinking, well, that people around the world are gonna operate with the same level of ethics and standards that we have. We have to understand China is not. China has no interest in any way, shape, or form of living up to the standard that we have in the United States. They will lie, cheat, and steal to achieve their ends. Let's call it for what it is. Uh, they are willing to do that. And what we have to do is to say, no, we, we, are, we are not going to stand for that. That's unacceptable behavior. We have to hold them accountable. We have to identify the efforts that they undertake to do those things. And we have to make sure, too, that uh, we uh, understand the level of effort it will take on our part to make sure we counter and deter the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, and, and actually that's, that's, I think what's important is, if I can pull up this slide here for a moment, I think what's important as one looks at the types of organizations involved, there is the Chinese Communist Party. We're not talking about necessarily, at least I'm not talking about just the, you know, the, the Chinese population has to live in this country. Yes. So um, many of its uh, uh, population are, are being repressed right now. Yes. So what, what, what part of what we've looked at are activities of the state and yes. the, the Communist Party. But I think what's interesting is how extensive Chinese um, activities are on all these fronts, but from multiple different uh, organizations. So, mm -hmm. so as we've pulled up here, Chinese Coast Guard, mm -hmm. uh, the People's Armed Maritime Militia, yes. which are active in places like the South China Sea, the People's Liberation Army and the various components of it, from the Air Force to the Navy to the Rocket Force yes. to the Strategic Support Force. We've also had some uh, r uh, removals of a number of uh, senior mm -hmm. Chinese uh, military leaders as well as uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, but also Chinese intelligence activity, yes. Ministry of State Security, United Front Workers Department. I'm gonna circle Ministry of Public Security for a moment mm -hmm. because one of the things we have seen in the U.S. Yes as well as overseas, is the, the Chinese set, uh, setting up um, locations. Some might call them police stations, probably not quite the equivalent to a police mm -hmm. station in the U.S., but they have been used, and we've seen the FBI arrest individuals in the U.S., including in and around New York, as, right. call, as what, uh, part of what is sometimes called Operation Fox Hunt. Yes. Uh, the monitoring of individuals residing in the United States by Chinese yes. intelligence services. Yes. How big of a concern is this kind of activity in the U.S. for you? I think it should concern everybody. Chinese presence in the United States that are, that are, are out there actively going after Chinese dissidents is the tip of the iceberg. Because if they're here doing those things, uh, then I believe they're also here doing other things. Uh, to, to create influence in certain areas or to counter what are in the U.S. interest uh, to, to push things in the Chinese interest. I think we ought to be very, very concerned about that. Uh, and 
The question then becomes, what do we do to identify that and deter that? I think we have to be much more focused on the things that we do here in the United States. And it's across the spectrum. It's not just people that come here from China through our normal ports of entry. It's also looking at, you know, what's happening on our borders. What's happening with, with uh, Chinese uh, individuals that, that are coming, uh, coming across our borders uh, not wanting to be detected? You know, uh, what's the magnitude of operations that are happening there? You mean those aren't just innocent people coming across our border? <laughs> I would say not. I would say that they're coming here for, for other, other purposes. So the question is, is, how do we ramp up our efforts to identify those individuals? How do we ramp up our efforts to make sure we're collecting intelligence to detect what those activities might be? how they're looking to undermine every aspect of, of what happens in the United States. And remember, this is at every level. So it's not just at the federal level. It, we also see some activities at the local and state level. So I, I think we have to understand what the Chinese are willing to do. They, they have a very long-term focus on this, and they will look at every place where they can exploit what they see as a weakness of the United States. Uh, we have some questions from uh, those online uh, that I'll get to in a moment, but I wanted to continue with this thread. We're talking about the U.S. right now and the U.S. homeland and Chinese activity here. Um, I do think it's important to also touch on some issues that I think everyday Americans uh, see or have to deal with. Uh, if we go to the monitor for a second, uh, we will look at the Daryl Morey, um, the general manager for the Houston Rockets, sends a, a tweet out critical of the Chinese and supportive of those in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. The Chinese respond with a vengeance. Uh, yeah. They end up, uh, over time, causing the NBA to lose about a half, over half a billion dollars. They take the merchandise off the shelves. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've seen, some would argue, Hollywood movie studios very yes. cautious about mm -hmm. portraying uh, the Chinese government in anything uh, in any kind of a controversial yes. light. It is worth noting that if you look at the box office statistics in China, the top two movies in the history of China are both recent. One is Wolf Warrior II, mm -hmm. and the other is the Battle at Lake Chongjin. Mm -hmm. Both are wars. Yes. Wars against the United States. Yes. So we are self-censoring, some would argue, in the U.S. They are clearly not right. in, in, uh, in China right now. So I highlight these issues. Pressure, we've seen it with the NBA. Yes. Uh, we've, we've seen it on uh, information. Kids, uh, adults go to the movies in, in the U.S. How much does this kind of an information campaign matter and, and how much should Americans be alert to these kinds of activities? Well, it does matter. The Chinese are all about uh, manipulating information and also trying to create their image in the way that they want the world to see them. And we had a great visit out at Disney with Bob Iger, with members of the Strategic Committee. Uh, and it was interesting to get his perspective on things. So we asked him specifically, we said, we know that Disney has a lot of content that they send into China. Obviously, they have their entertainment park there in Shanghai. Uh, Bob goes back to the days when Xi Jinping was the governor of Shanghai, so he knows him well. And we asked him, what's happening with Disney content? And he says, yes, the Chinese do go to them and said, we want you to make this change, this change, and that change to the content that Disney sends into China. And where Bob says that they draw the line is if it changes the content of the production, they refuse to do it. But if there are little things like images that don't make any, any significant content change, that they're willing to do that. So it shows that, that, that the Chinese do have an influence. They're very mindful of appearance, and they, at every turn, look to influence and censor the information that comes into their, into their countries. They are very, very much about manipulating how people view them. So one other item along these lines, which I know uh, you've sponsored legislation on, is TikTok, which yes. I think uh, any teenager, probably even younger generation in the United States is familiar with, for better or worse. Can you explain the legislation that, that uh, uh, you have sponsored, what, and what's the broader threat here? Sure. Well, the, the bill, H.R. 4545, is about making sure that we take TikTok out of the, uh, the, the state platforms at these institutions. 
So we, we, we're not going to control what somebody has on their personal cell phone, but what we don't want is there to be a conduit on devices that are part of those universities' uh, uh, public assets. And why? Because in many instances we see that China is using that to be able to gather information, whether it's on students or activities there. I was out at MIT recently talking about the things that MIT does. They work there with the Air Force. They do a lot of very advanced work there. Again, if, if you have MIT-sponsored uh, uh, devices there, those are devices that Chinese will use to try to get insight into those activities, try to get information about what's happening there. So what we want to do is to be able to cut off what the Chinese will use as a conduit to get what ends up for them to be critical information. And, and, it, and it may not be classified information, but it gives them many times an insight into what we're doing, how we're doing it, and gives them an advantage. They will look to try to gain any advantage in any way that they can. Uh, and what we need to do is to, is to cut off those conduits that they are using today, TikTok being one of them, to gather information. And remember, too, the, the Chinese are all in on artificial intelligence. And the, and the baseline for success in advancements in artificial intelligence is data. Mm -hmm. The Chinese right now are doing everything they can to create as many vacuum cleaners of data as they can around the world because they know that will help them advance artificial intelligence. What we have to do is to make sure that we turn off any vacuum cleaner that might have them access data or information that comes from the United States or for that matter any of our United States interests around the world. I wonder if you could um, talk a little about it since you, you mentioned earlier Confucius Institutes, Thousand Talents Program. How do you balance uh, having an open education system mm -hmm. but also monitoring uh, operational security concerns yes. at our university. So, you know, we certainly want, and, and our country was founded on, having uh, individuals from across the world uh, come. Uh, they benefit us in many ways. But we've also seen attempts to influence yes. uh, debates. I mean, one of the things that was interesting when I was doing my graduate work at the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. they had a Confucius Institute. That Confucius Institute was on campus, it was yes. in a university building, they essentially uh, refused to allow any uh, discussions on controversial issues like mm -hmm. Tibet, uh, what had happened in Tiananmen Square, mm -hmm. Hong Kong, um, on a university campus. This is yes. freedom of speech. So the university, uh, at, at the end of the day, it's not a good fit. So they right. shut down the Confucius Institute. We've seen Thousand Talents program uh, also being used by the Chinese to try to gather information, whether it's nanotechnology. We have seen some arrests, yes. including at Harvard University of individuals involved. Um, and it's not just in the Thousand Talents program, which is not necessarily illegal. Mm -hmm. It was also about lying to on Department of Education and Department of Defense um, contracts, mm -hmm. uh, and then lying to investigators that came yes. to ask some questions. But there's a lot of effort to collect information, mm -hmm. uh, to influence what is going on in our universities. Yes. Uh, how do you balance that between, you know, having an open system, but also, you know, being being careful here? Sure. That's that's a, that's a, a, a tough effort to try to find that balance. You know, our universities are great places where there's exchange of thoughts and, and learning takes place through that process. So you don't want to shut that off. But what you want to make sure, too, is that we are creating vulnerabilities by critical information that gets to be part of whether it's research or discussions in universities to have that used by, by the Chinese. I think the key element of that is to make sure that folks at these university campuses are aware of what could be done with the information and the dialogue that, that they exchange. I think you just have to be more aware of it. Uh, I, I don't think you I don't think you come up with a structure to say we're going to stop this or stop that or stop this because when when you do, that in itself becomes some form of censorship. Now, I, I don't want that. But what I want to make sure is that people think critically about what they do, and what they say, and who or what on campus may be the conduits for that to understand. Am I saying something here that maybe could be used by the Chinese? Uh, for, uh, for a strategic or an economic advantage. So I, th I think we just have to think more critically about how these things happen on a, on a campus. And two, many times it's aspects of research, many times research that has a national security implication, to think a little more critically about 
well, how could this be utilized? Uh, I'll give you a, a great example. When I was uh, at, at a university, I was doing some, some, some journal work and writing some, some journal articles on, on biological hazards, specifically uh, some pretty insidious bacteria that, that cause uh, fatal human health conditions. And it was interesting that I, at the time, when, when we were in, in this back and forth with what was happening in Iraq, I got a request from a scientist in Baghdad to send him a copy of the article that I wrote about these toxins produced by these bacteria, biotoxins, biotoxins that had a biological weapons component to them. So I looked at it and said, there's a reason why this person is asking me for this, and it's probably not for, uh, you know, advancement of scientific knowledge. So I actually went to uh, a couple of our federal agencies and said, by the way, I just want to let you know that this, this researcher in Baghdad is asking for this information on toxins that have a biological weapons component to it. So, so they were aware of that. So I think it's just those sorts of things that you have to make sure that people are aware of now. So if they, if they start to see these little connections, to make sure that they back up and go, whoa, wait a minute, l l let me make sure that I'm not either sharing information here or that I'm asking the right questions or pointing this out to the right people that may be able to dig a little bit deeper. So a lot of this activity is, uh, or some of it anyway, is in the clandestine area yes. where the Chinese are operating either um, uh, covertly uh, or if they're overt, it's not entirely clear always what they're doing or how they're trying to influence. Then there's the espionage cases. Yes. And so, you know, in our most recent uh, research, we looked at over 100 Chinese espionage cases and found that not only are they pervasive in the U.S., uh, but they are used to execute and plan all types of other operations yes. that they're yeah. doing. So you recently signed a letter requesting a briefing from the Pentagon and FBI on Beijing's intensifying campaign on espionage. What can Congress help do mm -hmm. uh, along these lines to counter this activity and what types of resources or funding do you think will effectively combat Chinese activity? And I, you, you can answer this at the federal level or sure. also the state and local level mm -hmm. as well, but espionage is increasingly a problem for the Chinese. It is, and it's a problem at every level as I pointed out earlier. What we have to be able to do is first gather the information to understand the magnitude of this problem. That's why we asked the FBI and DOD to, to give us the details of that. We want some granularity as to, as to the pervasiveness of these, these particular efforts. Let's make sure we identify the problem and then I think we can look at what's the federal nexus. But we also want to make sure that we look at things that are happening at the state level. You know, states like New Jersey and for that matter even Virginia are putting in place some pretty vigorous cybersecurity efforts. In Virginia, the National Guard has the, the Virginia Cybersecurity uh, Task Force where they, I think, have one of the best cybersecurity efforts of any state across the nation uh, in looking at what's happening with this cyber attack uh, uh, effort by the Chinese. Another thing, too, is to look at what, what do we do to, to, to look at strengthening economic ties with, with Taiwan. The, the governor in Virginia has created a now a, a Virginia-Taiwan trade office to where we want to elevate that, again, to counter what China's doing economically. We have to identify the problem. We have to look at uh, where are statutes either not being enforced, uh, where the statutes need to be improved, what's happening at state level, what's happening at, at the local level. This has to be an all-government approach it has to look, too, about what tools do we have, either that we're not using or not used fully, or what additional tools might we need to counter these, these incredibly insidious efforts by the CCP. Yeah, it does appear, even in our discussions with the FBI and the, and the FBI counterintelligence folks, that they are swamped right now yes. in cases uh, that they are involved in at the federal level. Yes. And we've talked to a number of states, uh, New Jersey, we've talked to uh, Virginia, but if we take, say, the New Jersey uh, Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, partly because of their location in around New York City, same yes. thing with Virginia and mm -hmm. the Washington, D.C. area, they are swamped, even yes. at the state and local level, yes. with Chinese activity collecting in and around their states and trying to influence, and then, at, as you noted, the, um, uh, the cyber level. So I, I think people do need to understand that this is more than just a federal issue. Sure that the state and local level are being sucked into this yes. uh, because it's pervasive at that level as well. It is. The Chinese are, are absolutely opportunistic 
and aggressive. They will look for any opportunity, any weakness, and they will look to exploit it. And that includes local and state governments. And for folks at those levels that think, oh, you know, this is a, this is a, a national, international effort. We don't have to worry about Chinese efforts. Here they do. And it can be something as simple as a small town that has a water system to look at vulnerabilities in the water system. I mean, you wouldn't normally think about that. You'd look at it and think, we live in the United States. We're safe. The military protects us. Our, our local police departments protect us. But what happens is, is China is very, very adept at looking at vulnerabilities. And, and while there may not be a direct threat, if they see that as the ability to layer threats, they will do that. And it includes from the very smallest local government all the way up to the national level. So one issue that, that I know you have uh, stressed in the past um, and that, that is an issue and actually highlights in many ways the global nature of what the Chinese are doing, not just in the U.S. homeland, not just in the area you just visited in the Indo-Pacific, but also globally, is, um, is Chinese technological activity. Yes. And I mean, the U.S. is a global technological and innovation leader. How do you characterize uh, the threat from China. And if uh, before you answer, if I can just pull up the screen here, one thing that's interesting uh, is when you look here at various layers of uh, internet technology, we've got a range of U.S.-based companies that we've highlighted with their software applications, storage and software infrastructure, uh, and then uh, PRC-based companies. Mm -hmm. There is intense competition that matters to a great deal. If you look, for example, at um, uh, a range of activity on where is someone in the um, uh, in the global south, what what service are they using? Right. Are they using Google? Yes. Or are they using another uh, provider to do that? Mm -hmm. And if so, what's the algorithm behind what they're able to see and what not to see? There's a tremendous amount of influence that comes. Right. So there's a lot at stake in these areas. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk a little about the threat that the Chinese uh, pose and then, um, and then anything we can do along these lines? Uh, and, and then we're going to try and wrap this up in about three minutes. Sure, so. sure. Well, we, you know, we've had some great visits with folks that are in, in the business of protecting systems from places like Oracle and CrowdStrike and others, so we understand the threat there from the outside. But uh, the other aspects of what you point out here, equally as important, is you know, what happens nefariously internally within these systems? You know, what, what happens with, with other folks trying to influence that aren't necessarily part of an algorithm, but are part of another uh, orchestrated effort to have an influence in, in those systems. And what we want to make sure we understand is, is not just the hardware elements, the, 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 the things we do to protect those systems, but what are, what are, the, what are the software elements? What are the things that can happen in, in, in the development of technology? I mean, the, the next industrial revolution is going to be artificial intelligence. The question is, is you know, how do we make sure we put the right boundaries on that or the right guardrails on that because AI can be used for some incredibly good things but it can also be used for some incredibly bad things. I worry that the Chinese will try to use it for some incredibly bad things. So as we see this and we see the the physical infrastructure, we see the software infrastructure, we see the data infrastructure, how do we make sure we understand all the different um, vulnerabilities in those systems and how do we make sure we protect that? And again, in our society, we don't, we don't want to shut those things down like China does to right. their people, but what we want to do is to put the proper guardrails on there. We want to make sure that we put in place the proper protections. That takes a significant amount of effort, and it takes everyone thinking a step ahead, thinking about what could the vulnerabilities be here. It's unfortunately we have to think that way, but we have to put ourselves in the shoes of saying, what, what would somebody with insidious or nefarious intent try to do, i.e., the Chinese? and then try to stay a step ahead. Uh, listen, the, the people that want to do bad will always, unfortunately, be even a little bit ahead of what we try to anticipate. But we have to do, we have to do a better job of being proactive rather than reactive. Right now, through the years, we've been very much reactive in protecting systems, looking at how, uh, whether it's information, software, hardware, data, uh, is, is vulnerable. What we have to do is not only to be uh, reactive in protecting those systems, but we have to be more proactive in looking at what could a possible vulnerability be. And instead of waiting for the system to go in place and thinking about what the potential uh, um, uh, vulnerabilities are, 
when we're designing these things, when we're constructing these things, we have to get to the left of the curve and say, okay, as we design these things, let's design them with the, with the mindset that there are certain things that people with nefarious intent could try to do. Uh, I think that's the mindset we have to assume now. Well, Congressman Whitman, thank you very much uh, you. for spending a few minutes with us today. This is an incredibly important subject, yes. as you've highlighted. Thanks for all the work that you're doing, not just uh, for your uh, district, for your state, mm -hmm. but for the nation writ large. And I think as you highlighted today, uh, the, the issues that we have to pay attention to from China are global in nature, yes. and they cut across everything from conventional activity to gray zone or political warfare activity yes. to technology to even our education institutions. Yes. So thank you for what you're doing in all thank of those you. areas to protect the nation. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks to CSIS too for the great work that you all do in really unfolding the layers of the challenges that we face in the future. Great. Well, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.